Good morning. And welcome to day three of uh, the 2020 DNI short course. And uh, we're very glad for all of you to be joining today. I think it's going to be a really exciting day. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So here's our agenda for day three. We'll start out just with a brief recap of uh, the last couple of days and an introduction to what we're doing today. And then at 10.15 to 11.15, we'll have our first uh, discussion, which will be uh, featuring Laura Damschroeder and Byron Powell discussing identifying strategies to address contextual barriers. Um, we'll have a short break, 15 minutes from 11.15 to 11.30. And then from uh, starting at 11.30, we have a great case study panel, which um, I think exemplifies bringing it all together, uh, identifying strategies to address uh, context. And um, the panel will be followed by a discussion as we have done the other days. Then from 12.15 to 12.45, we have lunch. Lunch is a little shorter uh, today but that's because we want to have time for emerging questions in the um, afternoon. So we have teed up questions that um, we've received from Menti in the last couple of days and um, we'll be looking to um, have a great discussion um, uh, with Byron and, and Laura and um, Andrew and I uh, to answer those emerging questions and with the audience, uh, with the, all the attendees as well. And then finally at 1.45, we'll do a wrap up and um, that will be the end of our short course. So next slide. So we would like you to start by going to Menti and uh, the first question for the day is in one word, how would you describe the last two days? And if you wanna go ahead and go in now and just start answering, we'll be seeing this forming on the screen as a word cloud. And it'll give us a sense of how much, um, where, where the attendees are in meeting in, and how we can respond uh, with our panels today. We can um, give it a, another minute for other answers, but wow, okay, <laughs> it looks like it's refreshed. We'll let it do one more refresh. which it should be doing in a minute. All right, great. Well, these are the kinds of words we think we like to see and very glad that um, people seem to be getting a lot out of it. So uh, that's good. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So I think um, if we're ready, we can go ahead and get started with our um, wonderful guest faculty, Laura Damschroeder and Byron Powell, who have done a fantastic job the first two days talking about um, frameworks to understand context and how we um, adapt to context with the implementation and then looking at uh, implementation strategies. So today, uh, Laura and Byron will be talking about identifying strategies to address, address contextual barriers. So synthesizing a lot of what's happened the first two days. So Laura and Byron, thank you. 
Thank you, Jane, and, and thank you all for being here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, let's get this pulled up. We're excited to, to kind of bring this all together in day three and to talk about how we can um, uh, really ensure that implementation strategies are responsive to the context that we're working in. Um, and, and just to start off, I uh, want to acknowledge, of course, that um, hopefully you, you um, have gotten from, from day one and two that context is very important in implementation science. Um, I think we've talked a lot about um, how we assess context um, quantitatively and qualitatively, and we can continue to talk about that a bit more today. Um, I think we've also realized that um, there are important questions out there about how do we actually prioritize the types of contextual factors that we would like to address in implementation. I also want to just acknowledge that, uh, you know, as we think about the settings that we're working in, um, we want to acknowledge tremendous contextual variation. Um, so I, I often work in children's mental health service settings. Um, and this is um, this figure on the right is from a paper under review uh, by Rebecca Stewart and colleagues. Um, and they acknowledge that um, just, just like we have sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, uh, for individuals, we can also think about a hierarchy of needs for um, organizations that we're working in. Um, so some of them, I mean, if they're struggling to keep the lights on, um, to stay compliant with regulations, to retain their workforce um, or, re or retain consumers, you know, implementing evidence-based practices is not always uh, at the top of their list. Um, and so oftentimes in implementation, um, we're faced with this need to um, address a lot of fundamental contextual factors um, that are really preconditions to implementing evidence-based practices. We also stressed, I think, that uh, we need a lot better methods for understanding and prioritizing determinants. Um, we've gone a long way in the field and certainly um, frameworks like the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research have done an amazing job, I think, of, of laying out the potential barriers that we face in implementing evidence-based practices. Um, but we've, we've highlighted that we need um, better measures uh, in our field um, and more pragmatic measures that would allow us to assess these factors routinely. Um, we've done some work to stress this need for pragmatic measures and, and to come up with some criteria for um, uh, you know, what pragmatic measures look like. Um, and those are, are shown here in this paper in Translational Behavioral Medicine led by Cameo Stanek. Um, again, we've also stressed, I think, the importance of mixed methods. Um, so oftentimes, um, uh, really the, the combination of qualitative and, mixed, uh, qualitative and quantitative methods are necessary to really fully understand the nuances of the context that we're working in. And we'll provide some more examples of that throughout the day. And I want to stress um, uh, the importance of understanding sort of dynamic uh, relationships between barriers. So um, uh, sometimes when we think about factors such as the CIFR and many of the other models that we're dealing with, um, they do a great job of comprehensively laying out the barriers. They don't always necessarily describe what the relationships are between these barriers. And some have proposed the use of this type of modeling um, whether it's uh, system dynamics modeling or just this, this causal loop structure for understanding how barriers relate to each other. Uh, admittedly, this is tough to, to talk through, but this is from a paper by um, Sarkis and, and colleagues that was just published in Implementation Science recently, where they conducted a systematic review of the literature to identify um, barriers to implementation um, and then use this causal loop diagramming to present the relationships between these different um, determinants as they're represented in the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. So I think this is a nice um, example of really pushing us forward, um, you know, just from simple lists to really understanding relationships between factors. And we also want to emphasize here and really throughout the day that there's tremendous room for um, innovation. And as we're presenting various methods, I think there are a lot of opportunities to apply and test uh, new methods in the field. And so um, we're really excited to see the innovative approaches that have been represented in the panel presentations uh, during the last couple of days and um, as well as in the small group discussions. We've also started to talk about implementation strategies and this is a, a, an old slide stolen shamelessly from Brian Mittman um, where he suggests that implementation strategies should really be um, theory based and presented with a logic model and yesterday we talked about the notion of really trying to understand how and why implementation strategies work. 
And one way of doing that is to really present a clear logic model or to use theory to um, sort of un undergird your approach to implementation. We also approach, we also discussed the, the notion of multifaceted and multi-level uh, implementation strategies. And when appropriate, um, it's, it's best to use those. Um, though we also, you know, uh, discussed this notion that we can't necessarily assume that we need complicated, complex implementation strategies um, without understanding the, um, uh, the behaviors that need to be changed and the um, factors that may get in the way of those changes. We hope that implementation strategies would be robust or readily adaptable so that they would either apply across settings or that we would have guidance on how they could be tailored uh, to address contextual needs in various settings. We obviously hope that they would be feasible and acceptable to key st stakeholders. And I think we talked a lot about, you know, whether there's actually demand for the intervention being implemented, as well as um, how can we um, use principles like user-centered design and other approaches to really optimize implementation strategies and interventions for various settings. Ultimately, we hope that these strategies are compelling, saleable, trialable, and observable. Um, and then of course, sustainable, cost-effective and scalable. Um, so this is a high bar, but hopefully um, either in, um, uh, in practice, hopefully we have some evidence that our implementation strategies um, uh, will meet these marks or in principle, hopefully we have some at least strong idea that we can um, uh, achieve these goals um, and, and uh, as we advance to um, uh, understand the effects of implementation strategies empirically. And much of what we're gonna talk about today is how we can ensure that implementation strategies are contextually appropriate. Um, and we think there are a number of ways uh, that we can do this. Um, and this, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list um, some of what we're going to talk about today is really trying to think about um, methods for systematically designing and tailoring implementation strategies. So um, can we design it thoughtfully from the outset so that we're considering the needs of key stakeholders, we're considering context, we're integrating evidence and theory into our, our um, uh, early formative work on implementation strategies, um, and can we come up with systematic methods to adapt or tailor our implementation strategies when necessary. Um, and we, we noted some of these resources yesterday um, and just wanted to stress that today we'll provide some examples of, of intervention mapping um, as well as um, a tool to link um, CIFR and ERIC implementation strategies that Laura will share. Another thing that we could do to really um, ensure that strategies are contextually appropriate are to really um, identify and optimize strategies that are really inherently adaptive. So one example of this is something like facilitation, which is really sort of a meta strategy, um, if you will, and, and um, uh, is obviously something that's highly flexible, um, that facilitators could work with a variety of settings um, to understand their context and to um, uh, identify and apply appropriate uh, implementation strategies within those contexts. And I think there are a number of strategies that uh, we use that could be um, adaptive and contextually appropriate in this way. The other thing that we talked about uh, was this idea of uh, adaptive strategies or uh, that some of which could be um, developed through sequential multiple assignment randomized trials. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, have time to sort of, you know, uh, share the nuances of these methods. Um, the top two papers are from um, Amy Kilborn's study called the ADEPT study. Um, and uh, the, the SMART trial and these adaptive strategies really are one way of thinking about how can we um, ramp up implementation efforts when we have um, uh, individuals, organizations, and systems that don't necessarily respond uh, to a lower intensity intervention? Uh, so in this case, they randomized sites. Um, and then for those that did not respond, they randomized um, these sites again to either receive just external facilitation or internal and external facilitation, a more intensive intervention. Um, and for those that um, were initially not uh, non-responsive, uh, the combination of uh, internal and external facilitation um, was shown to be superior. I haven't uh, sort of fully digested the findings of this paper and health services research on the bottom, um, but uh, please do take a look at that and the protocol paper if you'd like to see more details uh, um, about smart designs as well as 
um, this particular study. I've also included a link here at the bottom. This is from a, a site at the University of Washington uh, that provides a lot of additional detail on a variety of study designs, uh, including smart designs. And I think that's a great resource if you want sort of a primer and some links to resources for, uh, for a range of designs. And then this final approach is, is a bit, I think, more aspirational at this point. I mentioned this briefly um, yesterday, but I think in, as we think about contextually appropriate strategies, it really would be nice if we could move uh, eventually towards uh, a more common elements model of interventions and strategies in some ways. And again, here the notion is that can we look across um, uh, different interventions or implementation strategies? So for instance, if we looked at implementation strategies that focused on developing implementation leadership or implementation strategies that work that that addressed something like um, uh, teamwork or team team um, based implementation strategies, could we call out what the common elements of those effective um, strategies are, um, and then uh, compile those common elements so that they could be used more flexibly um, by implementation facilitators and others doing this work? Um, and again, uh, I think the the methodology, the methodological challenges of doing that um, are that we need, you know, uh, rigorous um, uh, trials and other studies of interventions that show us what are these common elements and how do they work. And part of this hinges on um, something that I emphasized yesterday, which is we need better reporting for both interventions and implementation strategies in order to really identify what are these common elements uh, and how could they be applied in a more flexible manner. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Laura, who's going to talk about um, first a implementation strategy matching tool um, that was developed with funding through the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs in the US. Hi, thank you, Byron. Um, what a great setup. So uh, Byron and I uh, collaborated with Tom Waltz, um, uh, who led a, a process um, to map implementation strategies to see for constructs. So basically, you know, the idea is, okay, we can use the CIFR to, you know, qualitatively uh, identify key barriers um, and using some of the process that, that I talked through the very first day of this course. But then once we have that information, how do we go forth and identify strategies to address barriers specifically. And we did frame this as a question of addressing barriers. There is definitely an advantage or a strategy of leveraging existing facilitators as well. But for this um, particular study, we focused on addressing barriers. Next slide. <clears throat> So we um, sent out invitations to 435 uh, implementation researchers and practitioners that were known to the team. Um, so we uh, identified these people through uh, various listservs and networks that we were members of collectively. 39% of those um, uh, individuals responded to this really kind of um, uh, I don't want to say long survey, but it certainly took a lot of thought to, to uh, respond to this survey. Next slide. So respondents were presented a randomly selected C for barrier and asked to select and rank up to seven strategies from the ERIC list that would best address the C for barrier that they were being uh, presented with. And our goal was to get at least 20 responses for each of the CIFR barriers in order to have enough um, kind of power and uh, size to um, make, uh, to, to develop means and so forth. Our results were that across 39 CIFR barriers based on the CIFR constructs, we got an average of 47 different ERIC strategies and, they, and it ranged from 35 to 55 for each of the CIFR barriers. And that, that were endorsed at least one time um, as being one of the top seven strategies. 
So what this is saying is that there was not a lot of consensus on which strategy would best address which barrier. And Byron, uh, later in this, in a few minutes after uh, I present this work, will talk about, um, really kind of touch on and expand um, some approaches to help address this lack of consensus. One of the reasons for this, um, you know, kind of diversity in recommendations um, certainly would have to do with the, uh, a range of assumptions that people are bringing to the table when they're responding to these questions. So for example, if the lack of leadership commitment is a barrier, you can imagine, well, which leaders and why are they not committed? Is it because they don't know about it so they need more education? Is it because they don't, um, you know, that they don't have the incentive so we need to put incentive structures in place, um, et cetera. So all that to say, we did identify what we called level one recommendations where the majority of the respondents for that barrier um, endorsed that as a strategy, as a best strategy. So those are kind of the strongest recommendations. And then we identified level two recommendations where 20 to um, just less than 50% of respondents endorsed. And this actually represents, I mean, this is a really wide range of endorsement, but it represents the top kind of quartile of um, responses. Next slide. So um, just one word, what I wanna say is that there are over almost 3000 different combinations when you multiply across um, the number of CFER barriers and the number of ERIC strategies. And that's not even considering um, kind of the, the many to many relationship between these two um, sources. And we were able to somewhat um, shrink down the, the range of choices um, based on the level of, re or these level one and two recommendations. So just as an example to walk through kind of the meaning of these results, if we had a CFER barrier of low um, reflecting and evaluating by implementing teams, which is a very common barrier and actually comes out as a significant barrier in a lot of our work, the level one recommendations that the respondents identified were first to develop and implement tools for quality monitoring and to audit and provide feedback. And these are two strategies that I think logically definitely passes like the, the face validity test because in order to reflect and evaluate, you need to have data available. Teams need to be able to have access to, um, to data and to systems that provide that in an ongoing basis. So these two strategies, the majority of respondents um, did identify. Um, and uh, so these are solid recommendations to address this particular barrier. And we heard yesterday, and I think the day before, um, for example, audit and provide feedback is a very com you know, frequently used strategy and a really core strategy to a lot of the work that we do if this, isn't, if this data are not already available to the implementing teams. Level two recommendations to address teams with low reflecting and evaluating um, include eight additional strategies, including everything from kind of broad facilitation to help teams work together and do that uh, reflecting and evaluating to um, using data experts to basically help uh, navigate and digest and respond to the data that the teams uh, do have available. Next slide. So we do have a matching tool and you can see at the bottom, uh, first of all, there is a published paper in implementation science. Uh, Tom Waltz is the lead author on that. And then on our seferguide.org website, we have a link to this tool. One of the things in one of our groups, I think yesterday had a question about because they tried to download the tool and were not able to, there is a, um, a troubleshooting button on that same page. And if you follow the instructions, because there is an embedded macro, so a lot of firewalls and security um, tools prevent the use of macros from um, perhaps an unknown source. But if you follow those instructions, you should be able to successfully open the file. 
and what we've uh, we've set this up so that you can identify your high priority C for constructs, and then generate um, a table of outputs of um, that outputs kind of the highest priority Eric strategies for your combination of C for barriers. Next slide. As an example, the very first day I went through, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the paper that we um, published. And uh, really in conclusion, this is just really a starting point um, because of the wide diversity of responses by, um, by our expert respondents and the la lack of consensus that this represents. Um, but, you know, so it has to be used with caution. It's just a starting point. There are other uh, methods that really need to be used to help hone in on what the right choice of strategies are and then to specifically operationalize those strategies for your, um, for your particular work or your implementation. So uh, there's a case study uh, that I presented the very first day, the, the telephone lifestyle coaching implementation. Go next slide. And if you remember, we had a wide range of outcomes. Um, the highest sites had seven times the rate of referrals, which was our outcome uh, uh, measure of interest. Um, and we identified seven, go next slide, uh, seven key barriers based on um, the approach that I outlined on the first day. And then the next slide. Uh, again, we've got qualitative um, kind of explanation of how these manifest. And this qualitative information is really important to keep in mind because it's this more detailed information that helps to point to the appropriate constructs. Uh, next slide. Um, so here is output. You're not meant, don't worry about reading the individual words, but just to know that the output um, going across the top are the seven uh, CIFR barriers. And then going down on the left side in, the, in all of the rows are the list of Eric strategies. And what we've done is we've added up the percentage of respondents who endorse that strategy. So for example, the very first strategy on this list is identify and prepare champions. This particular strategy was endorsed by the majority of respondents for several of the CIFR barriers, not just uh, the ones listed here across the top of the spreadsheet. So you can see that there's a cumulative percentage of 248%. Now that doesn't mean a lot in and of itself, but what it does indicate is that if you were to sum all, all of the kind of percentages of endorsement across your prioritized barriers, this single strategy is the, the most likely to um, be able to lessen the effects or mitigate um, these seven barriers. And the use of champions identifying and preparing, you know, working with champions may address more than one barrier at a time. So you can see on the left side that this is particularly important to address um, failures with uh, appointing or recognizing implementation leaders and also with engaging key stakeholders that the, the green on the far right top there um, is the strongest level of endorsement. You, but you can also see how useful champions are for the other uh, yellow highlighted barriers as well. Next slide. So all this to say, there are other approaches as well. And, and like I said, Byron will be taking a little bit of a deeper dive into some other approaches. But for example, uh, the you know, questions about the theoretical domains framework and behavioral techniques came up yesterday. This is another process, it's similar. It's identifying where the behavioral um, or the individual level barriers might be and then mapping uh, techniques to address those at an individual level. And the behavior change wheel uh, graphic on the right represents the behavior change wheel that can help walk through that process. And I think it's back to you now, Byron.
Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute there. Byron, we've lost the, there the slides are coming up now. Great, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, intervention mapping uh, or implementation mapping um, as one approach to designing interventions and implementation strategies, obviously focusing uh, more on uh, uh, designing and tailoring implementation strategies at this point. Um, intervention mapping is a protocol that gives uh, that guides the design of multi-level health promotion interventions and implementation strategies. Um, and the, the textbook is now in its fourth edition um, that you see here on, on your left. Um, and Maria Fernandez, who's one of the co-authors of the textbook um, and has really advanced this, um, this approach within the field of implementation science, um, has been on the last few days. I'm not sure if she's on today or not, um, but uh, she gave a... Um, uh, a session at, or, or more on this uh, in the uh, ICTER short course um, a few years ago. And I have the link here to the slides and video if you're interested in taking a further look at this. Um, but intervention mapping has been used obviously to design interventions, um, to um, adapt interventions, and increasingly to develop and tailor implementation strategies. Um, and I, I think I'm not butchering this when I say uh, Maria often would, would talk about intervention mapping as, as sort of a, a, a consolidation of what good intervention developers typically do. Um, so in many ways, they've, they've drawn from effective approaches to intervention design um, and really consolidated that into a single protocol. Um, as I mentioned, Maria has really advanced this, uh, this with respect to implementation science. And they've since sort of um, really focused on implementation mapping or using intervention mapping to develop implementation strategies. Um, and this paper in Frontiers outlines the, the various tasks involved in this. And the first is really conducting a needs and assets assessment to identify who are the adopters and the implementers that you're, you're trying to work with. The second task is really to identify um, the types of implementation outcomes that you're um, uh, interested in changing the performance objectives, which are really kind of who needs to do what in a given setting in order to implement and sustain an intervention. Um, and then the barriers and facilitators to achieving those performance objectives, ultimately creating uh, matrices of change. Um, the third task of intervention mapping is then again, matching theoretical methods or implementation strategies um, to um, achieve those performance objectives and address those determinants producing implementation protocols or implementation plans, and then evaluating implementation outcomes. And I'm just gonna share um, uh, really one and maybe um, uh, just to highlight another approach to using this method. And, and we're using intervention mapping within the context of an NIMH funded um, K01, um, where we're looking at, can we help organizations, and in this case, specifically children's mental health organizations, to tailor implementation plans to their site-specific needs. Um, and in this case, we're implementing an intervention called trauma-focused uh, CBT, uh, which is an evidence-based program for children and youth who experience um, uh, uh, trauma and negative uh, symptoms due to trauma. And we're collaborating with um, the North Carolina Child Treatment Program and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, uh, which is a SAMHSA-funded network. Um, uh, here in the United States. Um, and this protocol paper has uh, much more details and it apparently also has the longest title ever. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm working on my, being more concise in my titles, but haven't gotten there yet. Um, and the idea here is of course that we have an evidence-based practice in TFCBT. Um, and we're really, we're really trying to test this approach called the collaborative organizational approach for selecting and tailoring implementation strategies or COAST-IS. Um, as a mechanism or as a, as a means of um, selecting and tailoring implementation strategies that would address the site-specific determinants um, uh, in these community mental health organizations. And ultimately, this study is really focused on, is this approach to working with organizations acceptable, appropriate, feasible, and can they do it with fidelity? And does it really make a difference for things like TFCBT fidelity? And just sort of in terms of the theoretical grounding of the study, 
we were driven by the exploration, preparation, and implementation, uh, sorry, implementation and sustainment model uh, developed by Greg Ahrens, which is really sort of a, um, a hybrid determinant and process model in the sense that it, it focuses on multiple phases of implementation. And just basically in terms of the intervention components for Coast IS, uh, it involves site visits, uh, five educational sessions, uh, the dissemination of educational resources, and then um, uh, monthly coaching and support for these organizations. So basically implementation facilitation or coaching. And in this case, the way we, we sort of operationalized uh, intervention mapping or implementation mapping is first uh, to conduct a needs assessment, um, thinking about what outcomes we're attempting to change, um, the performance objectives, again, who has to do what uh, during each of these phases to implement TFCBT, and then what factors facilitate or impede implementation. Um, and in terms of inputs to our needs assessment, um, we had multiple sort of ways of assessing barriers and facilitators within this context, um, as well as engaging um, uh, a variety of stakeholders. And the first, first sort of um, form of stakeholder input came through um, an organizational um, advisory board that was comprised of clinicians and organizational leaders who would be um, uh, similar to those who would use an intervention like Coast IS. And then we also engaged caregiver and youth advisory boards to understand, you know, from families and from the youth perspective, what are the challenges um, in terms of implementing and sustaining TFCBT. We also engaged um, the NCCTP uh, leadership team and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network Implementation Advisory Committee to inform this process. Another sort of foundational um, way of assessing barriers and, and facilitators in this context was to conduct a systematic review of the literature, um, which we mentioned yesterday as an important starting point when we think about barriers and facilitators. We shouldn't necessarily assume that we already, uh, you know, that we know nothing about the, the specific um, barriers for a given problem. There's a really growing body of literature uh, that supports um, uh, or that identifies determinants across settings. And then finally, surveys and site visits, which I'll, I'll get into briefly. Um, so we published this systematic review in, in 2019. Um, and this really identified, again, barriers across the four phases of EPIS, exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment, and a, really a variety of inner and outer context factors that can influence um, TFCBT and the implementation of other trauma-focused interventions. Um, you'll see here that there's much greater focus. The darker colors here um, indicate that there's much greater focus on the preparation and implementation phases, particularly implementation, and much less in terms of what are the identified barriers to uh, sustainment or to the exploration phase of the process. Um, but we, th we thought that this was helpful in at least giving us a baseline understanding of some of the challenges we might face. Um, after conducting in-person site visits to sort of qualitatively assess um, some of their uh, individual strengths and needs, we also administered um, a survey, and these are just um, five pieces of that. There are actually uh, a few other scales that we used, including um, Maria Fernandez and colleagues have a, um, a measure of the inner setting of the CIFR that we used um, uh, in addition to these listed here. Um, but things like organizational readiness for change, implementation climate, psych safety, uh, implementation leadership, and um, implementation citizenship. So how much are our sort of um, staff members in the organization going above and beyond for implementation? And, and hopefully you can see just from the ranges of uh, the scores here uh, that there was considerable variation in these contexts. So particularly looking at things like um, psychological safety in some of these organizations, there were significant concerns about that. Um, significant variation in um, implementation leadership, implementation citizenship, uh, and so on. And so this represented, uh, in a way, targets for change in these organizations that could be addressed. So in terms of identifying relative um, uh, relevant implementation strategies, we had organizations really go through this process of, of first specifying who has to do what in their setting in order to implement TFCBT. Um, what are the things that they think gets in the way of those performance objectives? And then specific actions that they can take to overcome challenges and achieve uh, their performance objectives. 
And we, we gave them this sort of um, brief um, Eric menu as a, as a potential um, list of strategies that they could apply. Um, but to be honest, most of these organizations were, were sort of selecting much more pragmatic strategies that were specific to their uh, organization. Um, and I can't say that they really relied heavily upon uh, this Eric guide in any way. As we helped them to develop implementation plans, we didn't exactly make them go through this process, but we, we did have them specify a lot of the details in terms of, you know, if they specified supervision, uh, we talked about yesterday, the, the devil's in the details. So how are they delivering supervision? Who's involved in that process? Um, how often does it take place? How will we know, uh, you know, how will we document that it happened um, or improve that strategy over time? And so we specified a lot of those things uh, in their implementation strategy in a collaborative fashion. Um, given the, the sort of the short pilot nature of the study, um, the, we didn't have a lot of time to sort of track implementation strategies and how they changed over time. Um, but we set these organizations up with a structure so that they could actually track how their implementation approach was changing over time and really revisit and reflect on um, uh, what changes needed to, to happen. And then lastly, with um, respect to implementation outcomes, again, through the study, um, uh, we're really focusing on acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, and fidelity for Coast IS itself, um, and also um, uh, fidelity of trauma-focused CBT. Um, uh, of course, in terms of the intervention mapping process, um, one of the, the steps would be really to evaluate what are the outcomes that are important to these organizations, um, and how can they track that over time. And so just wanted to highlight a couple sort of early lessons uh, learned from this process. We're, we're still um, collecting data at this point. Um, the pilot is uh, period is finished and we're just collecting and analyzing data at this point. But um, one of the things that was really clear to us was that the intensity and pace of the tailoring process varied considerably. So again, some of these organizations had uh, relatively simple structures. They were small in size and they had um, you know, really a strong staff that, that didn't need a whole lot of support. Um, whereas other organizations were much more complex, um, you know, maybe had multiple sites, um, more complex relational dynamics at those sites, um, different challenges with respect to implementation leadership, things that really made it challenge to go through, challenging to go through this process uh, of tailoring and also um, really just made the implementation plans a bit more intensive. There were more things that needed to uh, be addressed in order to implement and sustain TFCBT. Um, and, and I think this point I've already made, but just that the organizational hierarchy of needs is important. Um, one of the things that was challenging is when we struggled with things like psychological safety and communication at the organizations, um, it, it really was clear to us that those fundamental issues need to be addressed um, first. And it's, it's not clear how well we're able to do that within a short period of time. Um, but if for instance, staff members don't feel um, comfortable raising concerns uh, or don't feel like leadership really um, values them or, or hears their concerns. Uh, organizations continue to struggle with things like uh, clinician turnover and really aren't going to be able to implement evidence-based practices like TFCBT. So I think we have a lot of work to do to figure out, you know, um, time-limited ways to address some of those more uh, entrenched um, implementation challenges like, uh, you know, uh, poor organizational cultures and climates, uh, which can take some time to change. Also just wanted to note the importance of considering the link between inner and outer settings. So as we think about organizational factors, um, many of these were, were certainly heavily influenced by, you know, the funding environment for these evidence-based practices. Some of these organizations had things like um, uh, enhanced rates for the, the intervention, um, whereas others did not. Um, and uh, there were certainly resource differences um, in terms of how these um, sites were funded to do the work, which really made a huge difference uh, in implementation. So really trying to think about the linkage between those two uh, is, is important. Um, certainly we, we, we strive to um, facilitate learning within and across organizations. It's really helpful for organizations to be able to learn from each other about what's going well and how they can implement better. Um, uh, and we found that leaders uh, and clinicians really were generating creative ideas, both about implementation strategies, 
Um, and even when we ask them questions about, you know, how and why should these, uh, do you think these implementation strategies will work? Um, as we think about mechanisms of implementation science, uh, many of them had um, creative answers to that and not necessarily always, um, you know, what we would have done as facilitators or, or how we would have described how these strategies are really working. Uh, so the, the collaborative approach on this, on this front, we found really valuable. Um, and, and we're sort of going through a process right now where we're, we're um, uh, looking to conduct a multiple case study where we look at the differences between the implementation plans and how these were operationalized. Um, and we really found that the plans are quite different and reflective of the needs uh, um, of, of these different organizations. So we found the process valuable um, from sort of an interpersonal standpoint, but also in terms of the, the concrete product at the end, we did find that their needs really did drive different implementation approaches. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I bet you we're close to, to a, a finish. I just wanted to highlight, this is another study in which we're using intervention mapping in a little bit of a different way. Um, it's also comparing a standard and a tailored approach to um, uh, uh, implementation, and in this case, scaling and evidence-based intervention uh, for antiretroviral therapy um, for people who inject drugs in Vietnam. Um, and really the, the aims of this study are to compare two different intervention mapping approaches, so um, standard and tailored. And, and really this means that we use the intervention mapping approach to um, develop a standard implementation strategy. And then in the tailored condition, we're offering additional facilitation um, and a process by which um, organizations can receive um, uh, training in the tailoring process and support in tailoring uh, implementation strategies to their specific needs. And so in addition to the standard, standard strategies that they receive, they also receive additional support that will help them uh, to ensure that the strategies they're using are contextually appropriate. And ultimately, the goal is to see which of these approaches is more effective, to measure cost effectiveness of the, the standard arm versus tailored arm, uh, and then to use mixed methods uh, data to really explore what are the site characteristics of high and low, low performing sites, um, and what can we learn about um, you know, how we can better address or leverage those characteristics moving forward. This just kind of shows that, uh, that design again, using intervention mapping to develop the standard approach um, and then comparing that to a, a tailored approach over time. And this is, um, this is a study underway. Um, again, you could read more in the protocol paper on the, on the previous slide. Um, but uh, in this study, uh, again, you can see here two types of inter, uh, implementation strategies or interventions in the standard approach and the tailored approach. Um, and you can also see how the implementation outcomes um, uh, differ across um, the standard approach, tailored approach, and then also um, the ultimate uh, implementation outcomes related to um, SNAP, which is the intervention being implemented. Um, so for that, the primary outcomes are really uh, fidelity um, uh, and then secondary penetration, acceptability and cost. We're also assessing um, effectiveness of uh, the intervention in terms of viral suppression and medication assisted uh, treatment um, uptake. And I just wanted to end with, uh, since, since much of this work that I just presented is in process and we don't have uh, published papers to, to share, wanted to end with this paper from uh, Linda Highfield um, and colleagues, Maria uh, is on this paper as well. Um, uh, where they used intervention mapping or implementation mapping to uh, develop an implementation strategy to increase uh, mammography among low-income women. And I think this is a really nice paper. Um, uh, again, Maria, if you are on the, uh, the call or if others have examples of intervention mapping, please uh, plug them into the chat, chat uh, so we can see more recent applications of this, but um, wanted to provide that sort of basic overview. And hopefully I didn't go way over time or way under time. Just fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Byron and Laura. And we have, um, we do have time for questions. And we also have asked Maria, who has accepted being a panelist for the question and answer. So thank you so much, Maria.
and Surprise. we look forward to lots of uh, great Q and A here. So, Felice, if you have questions from mentee, that would be great. You're on mute, Felice. We still can't hear you. Do you want to, oh, we can't hear you. Would you like to um, pass over the mentee thing to somebody else? Do you want me to do that or? Or maybe you're muted on your computer. I think I will. Um, why don't I do that, Felice, until you get yourself uh, unmuted? Okay. So the first question is, um, thank you for everyone to, for putting them into Mentee. How do you determine the marginal benefit of each implementation strategy? Yeah, I, I think that this is, um something that came up yesterday as well and, and sort of what is the marginal benefit of each component strategy within a, a multifaceted approach is I, I assume what the person is asking i think so yeah so i think we we talked about a couple of approaches yesterday um uh, one is through using a formal factorial design where you um, might actually compare different types of implementation strategies uh, with different components. Um, and again, the smart design that we've shared about today is one way of doing that to see, for instance, um, whether, uh, like the example I provided earlier, whether um, it's better to get internal and external facilitation or whether um, external facilitation alone, for instance, would be um, sufficient or equally effective. So I think we can, you know, call out um, the benefit of certain components of interventions that way, formally through design. The other thing we discussed yesterday was um, given the challenge and, and expense of doing that is um, less sort of, I guess, definitive, but using qualitative and mixed methods to understand, you know, what components of interventions or implementation strategies did people find helpful um, within a given implementation effort. Um, and perhaps others have additional thoughts, but those are the two main things I think of. Yeah, and I think a, a theme that you'll hear throughout the day today is that um, our kind of lack of specificity about how exactly to assess and know what the additive or multiplicative effects are of different components of strategies and of interventions um, this means that there's a wide world of science that needs to continue to advance. And this is a, you know, can be an entire career trajectory for you to figure out, you know, how do we do this in efficient ways that give us answers, um, you know, in the time frame that systems and our partners really need. Um, definitely a challenge. And, 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 just, and I would just go ahead, Maria. Sorry, I would just add to that that some of the things that that Byron highlighted in terms of of the mechanisms and and also understanding the interrelations between the various constructs that you're trying to address that that's going to be really important as we move forward in trying to make decisions about what what implementation strategies to use because they affect other things um, and and also what uh, elements within implementation strategies are important to consider. Um, and going back to um, what Byron was sort of getting at with, with, with the Lego, the Lego slide, um, it will be forever referred to as the Lego slide. Um, because I think that that's important too. Uh, I think about those Legos as, as sort of the, the methods, you know, those techniques that often happen within particular strategies, but potentially can have an impact across a number of different constructs. So another question I have, 
relates to a um, question about implementation mapping. Uh, implementation mapping involves lots of planning and predictions by stakeholders. But Laura mentioned on day one that people are terrible prognosticators. So how realistic do you think it is? I can answer that. Um, so first, let me commend uh, Byron because I, I thought what he presented was uh, just a phenomenal example of a real world application of the process. and. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about Byron's example was the fact that it was, you know, it, it, it included a foundational principle of implementation mapping and intervention mapping when you're developing multi-level interventions in the first place of community engaged planning, right? That's, that's a foundational principle and I think it was exemplified in, in, in what he presented. Um, having said that, however, the process is based on making decisions that are based on evidence and theory and systematic planning so systematic processes so i would argue that these are things that even though we we all know they're good to consider they aren't often considered at least not in a systematic way when we're making decisions about implementation strategies and so of of course um, there are biases in terms of what people think might work, but it is infinitely better to make decisions about what might work based on what do we know from theory and what do we know from the evidence and what do we know might work from new data that we're collecting um, as part of the formative work about contextual factors and about the why answers to the question of why. Why would someone do these implementation behaviors? And, and these, are, these are just sort of part of the process of, of you know, what I call systematic planning um, that I think make it much more likely that you're gonna ultimately come up with um, the right decisions about what works. But it's absolutely true that there is subjectivity in the process. Um, but I would say less subjectivity than there usually is. Fantastic. Um, Laura, Byron, you don't have anything to add to that? Well, I was just going to add subject, um, systematic subjectivity <laughs> combined with, you know, best knowledge. I like that. <laughs> And, I, and I, this is sort of a question and a comment, but uh, Maria, tell me if this is wrong, but I, I remember it's been a while since I, I looked at this piece, but I think when we think about something like intervention mapping, for some people, it can feel like way overwhelming, like it's it's a, a huge process, um, which I think it it can be, but I think it's kind of like, it can take as long as you have. <laughs> so I think it can, can be quite pra pragmatic and to Laura's point, like, better better subjective and systematic in a in a briefer form than um uh than sort of throwing spaghetti at the wall um so i i guess as we went through it i was quite sure that we were cutting corners and um you know just by virtue of the time frame and the the number of organizations we we're working with it wasn't always possible to like you know let's do a systematic review on the evidence for this specific strategy or this uh, approach, um, but it, it did seem better than better than the alternative, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, no doubt. And and you know, I remember um, looking at Wikipedia. You know, what what do they what does Wikipedia say about intervention mapping? And and it was something like this is an extremely complicated process, but most people say it's great and really useful. And I was like, oh my god, okay, we have to do better at at that. Um, and so we do have we do have you know week long training um, courses and stuff about applying it, but um, we are in the middle of um, the the next edition of the textbook, and and one of the major goals is to you know how can we streamline this and make this um, easier. But I think you bring up a really important point, and I often get asked this: How long does it take to you know if you're going to use implementation mapping? Um, or if I'm using intervention mapping to plan a, a, a program, um, how long does it take? Well, it takes as long as you have. So if you have a week 
then it takes a week. If you have a year, it can take up to a year. I've, I've had planning efforts that have spanned that. Um, and I think that it has to do with um, what you said. You know, it's not really cutting corners. It's just using the logic. But, and you can do that in a week, like sort of walk through the logic of, of the process. But if you have more time, then you're going to have more evidence and more data to make decisions at each of, of the decision points. So that's essentially the difference is how confident am I mm -hmm. in, in moving to the, the, sort of the next step? So uh, I have another question and I have to admit this was mine in, in Tementi that uh, Byron, as I heard about your example, if strategies vary so much across clinics for a, a single intervention, then do you need to go through a separate implementation mapping for each clinic? And then how can you ever reach generalizability? Yeah, so I would answer that in a, in a couple of ways. Um, number one, with a lot of this implementation stuff, I, I'm starting to think more about like generalizable processes rather than like mm -hmm. comparing this strategy to this strategy. Um, so I think like, again, in, in my study, what we're really testing is the process of COAST IS and, and can we um, use that to tailor implementation plans. Um, another response would be, you know, if you really think about the, the implementation, I didn't have time to go into this, but the implementation strategies that these organizations are receiving you know, they were going through a learning collaborative, getting training on TFCBT. Um, and so there were a lot of sort of like core, you know, things that were similar um, that all organizations were receiving. Uh, and I think some of this tailoring um, it is not at all trivial, but is, is sort of like to supplement that around the edges uh, to support their organization specific needs. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that it like, at the end of the day, I don't think we thought like, oh, these organizations are completely different and, you know, needed an entirely different implementation approach. Um, but they did have site specific needs that needed to be addressed. And I think if we just used a one size fits all approach and just gave them the training and moved on or the learning collaborative and moved on, I think some of those things wouldn't be addressed. Um, but the last thing I'll say is Maria was generous and gave us a lot of time at the beginning of this study and and uh we we sort of were latched on to this idea of going through this process with each site um rather than coming up with sort of a generic implementation strategy and then presenting that to them and you know tweaking it around the edges um and maria your i don't know if you'll remember this but your take was sort of like definitely should probably go the way of you know, developing a, uh, a general strategy and then and then tweaking it, which honestly is probably the more efficient and better way. Um, uh, but again, I was stubborn and went this site specific way. Um, and I think I think there are pros and cons. I think it's it's you know less it's probably less scalable to do this way. But part of our hypothesis was also that there's something about the collaborative process and actually working with sites. Uh, to develop these strategies that would build buy-in and, and um, be helpful on that front. And I think we have seen some evidence of that from uh, just even our qualitative work so far that, you know, the sites appreciated sort of the, uh, that process and that engagement. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of droning on a bit, but, but I think that there are pros and cons about sort of whether we, whether we tailor to site specific needs or whether we, we start with more general approaches and then uh, um, you know, make smaller tweaks. Yeah, I, I think that this is a really interesting research question, actually. I, I agree that there's pros and cons. And, um, and I think, so just to be clear, because I know people might be getting lost in the weeds, that the difference between sort of a, a team doing a, a implementation um, planning process and, but it, and it's an engaged process. And, and what Byron is um, talking about is that Byron has actually did more than engage them in the process. He taught them the process, right, Byron? They, they actually did the process themselves. And that's what initially, he's right. I was, you know, I remember a, a long day when you were in Houston and um, I remember something about you having a really bad headache. Um, but 
you know, sort of this idea of, you know, and we were sort of debating the pros and cons. And, and I think that, um, you know, I was, I was skeptical. I was skeptical that you could go into an organization and sort of teach them implementation mapping and that they would come out, they would be able to, to do it, frankly. And I was sort of more saying, yeah, you know, you might want to sort of do this and then present options based on your, your results of, of an engaged process, but where your team is doing it. And, and I'm glad you pushed back because I think that there are a lot of, um, a lot of benefits to that. And, um, and, and I think it's an empirical question. And I think that there's times that you'd probably be more appropriate to go one way versus another. But one thing I did want to add is, um, you know, the, the ERIC strategies um, can, are, can be incredibly helpful. But as, as you've heard this morning, um, they represent like kind of qualitative, qualitatively different things. If you look at, at, if you compare them to each other, right? Some of them are really broad, um, sort of, you know, create education materials. And some of them are more specific, you know, use audit and feedback. And, and I think with, with um, implementation mapping, we really are clear about for, for the determinants that influence implementation, you're going to choose methods, which are these general um, sort of, uh, transferable, theoretically based techniques. And then you're gonna operationalize those to these practical applications. And so when I've looked at strategies and I say, well, what are these? What are the ERIC strategies? Are they methods or are they practical applications? And I think that they're more like methods um, and, uh, and also the form and function, I, if you guys are using those terms too, um, methods are more like functions and practical applications are more like the forms, right? But in any case, um, I think that it's useful to sort of do that exercise and, and try to, whether you're starting with strategies and trying to figure out um, what are the mechanisms through which those are working or you're going the other way and you're saying, I'm really gonna do this prospectively and I'm gonna build the strategies or choose strategies, but I'm gonna wait to get there until I've defined the determinants and, and you know, the how I think we're gonna change these determinants. Um, either way, either direction you go, I think it's really useful to go through that exercise because like I said, um, I think in the small group on the first day, even if you, when you have strategies and you're really confident about those strategies, you still have to develop the content that goes within those strategies. And that's an, an, another way that implementation mapping can help. I feel like I'm doing a commercial, but to be honest, like I don't know any other way to, to, to really um, you know, do a good job of, of the details of developing implementation strategies. So, um, there are other ways, and I'm, I'm I'm sort of learning what some of those might be. And 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 we found it to not at all be uh, I shouldn't say not at all, but we definitely found it not to be like totally linear. Like it was kind of iterative in terms of going back and forth. Uh, you know, are we talking about determinants? Are we talking about strategies? What like the it, 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 sometimes that reflected I think a lack of discipline on our part, but also just where the you know where the conversations went and. Uh, how the thinking occurred. So, I wanted to mention before I forget that um, this this is actually I'm really excited about this. Frontiers in Public Health is going to have a special topics issue, and um, the the call will probably not come out for another month and a half or so. But the abstracts um, are going to be due in April, and it's the whole issue is going to be about using implementation mapping to you to plan implementation strategies. So the goal is to have articles um, that that describe that process. There's there's already a special topics issue that's on intervention mapping, and it has maybe two articles within it that where people are using it to plan implementation strategies. But this special issue. Um, would be made up of, you know, it would be focused on implementation. And I'm still thinking about like 
maybe making it broader than just implementation mapping and using other systematic approaches to plan implementation strategies. But anyway, look for that call if you, if you have any articles that you might think could fit. That's fabulous, thank you. Do, um, if, we, if we had time, I, I want to um, kind of take a step back from everything that Byron and Maria are talking about. And because it can get very, um, you know, feel like it's very recursive or, um, you know, kind of back and forth. And like Byron said, certainly nonlinear. Um, but I, uh, one way to kind of frame this work is that there are macro level strategies. So like Byron, you mentioned training and learning collaboratives. Those are kind of high level strategies that you do need to operationalize at a certain level. And a mapping, implementation mapping can be used to help operationalize those, you call them core strategies, but um, really they're kind of macro strategies in that they are strategies that we think based on our knowledge of aggregate context across the settings that we're engaging in our study that have common elements, common needs, mm -hmm. and uh, a common need for a core set of macro, I, I'm just gonna call them macro level strategies, or maybe they're like meso level, because we, you know, kind of as implementation researchers from a central kind of brain trust and development are, you know, based on our knowledge of, uh, of context are choosing these um, strategies. But then when you go down to the individual settings, there are, a myriad of micro level strategies or techniques. I like the term techniques or, or um, uh, is that the term you use Maria? You, you have methods and then you have kind of those individual activities or techniques. Um, but those have to be very uh, local and very particular um, to the setting and the degree to which we as researchers engage and teach and you know, a systematic process for doing that um, versus, or it's a combination of the degree to which the local planning team or the implementation team, you know, goes through that process to determine, um, you know, that, that, so it's kind of both and, there's like the bottom up and the top down that, you know, hopefully meet in the middle for a good marriage and a successful um, implementation. Um, but I, you know, and I love that pyramid of need that you have, Byron, because you know, if an organization is down there toward the bottom of that pyramid, who else would know that better than the local, you know, hey, we're really concerned and overwrought with, you know, turnover. And so we need to kind of further constrain or we need to select some additional, I'm gonna call them micro level, you know, techniques or strat based on new strategies. And um, kind of related to all of this, like the level of application, the level of operationalization is that when there are, there have been systematic reviews that count the number of strategies that have been used in implementation. And sometimes the counts are really low. It's like three, you know, cause they're at the level of learning collaborative, audit and feedback, education, you know, maybe those are like the big three. But then there are others that really get down into detail, especially in the facilitation literature, when the question is, what strategies or approaches have facilitators used? Mm -hmm. And those often get into the multiple dozens of, um, of strategies. And I think that you know, both are true and um, you know, we have inconsistency in even counting you know, what exactly a strategy or a or a technique is. But like Byron said, there are these commonalities like use of a learning collaborative, um, use of education as an overarching approach or method. That's great. I'm gonna turn to a, a different question, but it has to do with the organizations with which uh, you work and I think part of it is related to Byron's study. What kind of support did you provide organizations to create and implement their strategies? And then 
Um, I think the related question to that is for everyone is, is there a baseline level of organizational readiness that you need in order to be able to participate in implementation mapping? Byron, you're on mute. Yeah, so, so the first question is interesting to me um, uh, in the sense that, again, I think the, the, the difference in approach. So if we were to sort of, sort of centrally create a strategy to say scale up TFCBT nationally using intervention mapping, we would obviously have more time to develop materials or you know, provide more support around the implementation strategies. Um, and the approach that we took to work with each site, I think we weren't able to provide that. So my, my, my sort of bent is more, um, how can they within their existing structures, you know, um, be encouraged to make more systematic decisions about how they implement things and how they're supporting their staff. So I guess, I guess we were really trying to work more within the resources that they had rather than to give them a whole lot of outside um, you know, support and, and to be doing a lot of the work for them, if that makes sense. Um, and, and again, I think in my mind, that's more just in, in terms of feasibility, what makes sense. And honestly, we've struggled with that. Um, in the study I referenced uh, in Vietnam, we've struggled with like, okay, if we're, if we're helping organizations, um, you know, to tailor these strategies, if we come up with an idea for a strategy, how much, you know, can we do additional trainings as the team or, can we do, you know, how much sort of like added resources can we uh, infuse into these sites? And, and and my bent has been to try to, uh, not to try to leave people high and dry, but to try to work within the structures that we're working within because it seems more reasonable to me. Um, and, and the second question about baseline level for intervention mapping, I don't, Maria, if you have thoughts about that. I mean, again, in our, we're, we're working with, you know, four different organizations. So it's a small little pilot study um, in this front. And, and um, I think we found it much easier to work with some organizations than others, but I, I wouldn't say that even in the organizations that were a little bit more difficult to work with, um, I wouldn't say that they, they weren't able to, to engage in the process. Um, you know, in the first, Thank you, Byron. Oh. Thank you. Oh, I shouldn't have asked that question, Byron, because we are at time. Oh. But, um, my apologies. But Marie, I'm going to give you a two sentence answer about the organizational readiness. <laughs> well, I think the important distinction is um, what are we talking about? Are we talking about readiness to engage in the process or readiness to implement the, the innovation, right? And, um, yeah. I think that's a that's an important distinction, and I would um, I would actually defer to to, to Byron about um, understanding more about whether an organization is ready to engage in that process because I think that the way that he's applied it is one of the first times I think that it's it's been applied in that way that you're you're sort of handed handing it to them versus a team that's experienced in the process, engaging them to go through it. I think it's a really interesting thing. And I, I think it remains to be seen to see how, how well uh, organizations are, are able to do it. So thank you. We, um, we may have opportunity um, later in the day to come back to this. It sounds like there's a lot more discussion for this, but we're gonna start a break and um, be back at 11.30 a.m for our next session, which is a panel presentation about pulling it all together. Thanks. Thank